So hello guys, today we have with us Chris Lee. He's a digital director, a copywriter, an author, and he runs a football blog, which I like I used to, on outsideright.co.uk, and he's a podcaster too. Much like my interviews, his blogs focus on culture, history, and travel mainly. So uh, hey Chris, how are you? Oh good, thanks for having me on. Uh, really yeah Chris, um, so I checked out your site, Outside Right, mm. and uh, it has everything related to football under the sun. And I really loved how you have covered everything from blogs to podcasts to book reviews to stadium reviews and about the reviews of cities which you have traveled to. So how did you exactly get the idea for each one of them? Yeah, it's interesting because um, uh, for Outside Rights, it's W-R-I-T-E because it's a play on words as in write because it started as a blog. Like I said, there is a podcast element to it and on social media like Instagram we do short videos. Um, but the idea for it, I mean... I always felt that there's a need for, I want to understand a bit more about the sort of context around football. So basically I've put it down as the uh, thinking fans or the curious fans um, blog, really. So it's kind of, uh, we look at the history, culture and the travel element rather than, you know, who's playing left back for Blackburn Rovers today. I'm not interested in the sort of what's happening nowadays. I like going to a game. I'm club agnostic in many ways as well. So I'll go to lot like, as a ground hopper go to lots of different experiences rather than the same one all the you know all the time so from that regard um i've always been curious um to understand that and because i've been exposed to other cultures such as or as a student in spain and that introduced me to a whole different um culture and i did my dissertation on spanish regional identity this is back in the late 90s um so um that kind of gave me the sort of genesis of thinking oh do you know what there is more there's more to football there wasn't this this kind of um there wasn't a culture of writing around that at that time. I think Football Against the Enemy by Simon Cooper came out. It was either late 90s or early 2000s. That's the first one that really explored the sort of politics of sport. And that sort of really turned me on to, to exploring that a bit further. So I didn't really launch the blog until 2015 or 16 because I was traveling a lot with work. And when I was go to, say, Amsterdam, I'd try and get a game in at Ajax. Uh, or, you know, um, Brussels, I'd go to um, check out a game there. And so it's... I think at that point I decided to sort of use an outlet like a blog um, to write about that experience and share that with other people because there's a lot, lot of online community around this. And then that one thing led to a podcast, um, talk about all sorts of elements, politics of elements, because um, obviously sport, and politics, football and politics go together really closely. Mm -hmm. And uh, that led to a couple of books, as you mentioned. So I'm, I'm author of my first book came out in April 2021, and that was called um, Origin Stories of Pioneers Who Took Football to the World. And that's about it's a country by country chronological story of effectively how the game got started. There's a, there's um there's chapters of pretty much every country in the world there, um and then also um a defiant the defiant history of football against fascism comes out in October so next month and that's yeah. um that's all about basically 100 years of opposition to uh, far right dictatorships through football which which is um, an interesting topic. Could you tell me, you know, some of the key instances, like what were the few instances which made footballers stand against dictators? I mean, what did they do? Like, can you give us a few examples in history? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it starts with Mussolini in 1920. So this actually October 2022 will be the anniversary of Mussolini's march on Rome, dictator of Italy from 1922 to 1943 and parts of it to 45. Um, he um, kind of... In installed a lot of what we know about Italian football today is a result of of him. So, you know, Serie A, our first national competition in Italy, um, yeah. Coppa Italia, uh, which was revamped under him as a national competition. Uh, a lot of the great stadia were built in this time as well. So a lot of the clubs were formed, in fact, Napoli, Fiorentina, um, AS Roma, they were all formed as kind of, um, kind of Mussolini in, uh, pushed to create great clubs for this new Serie A. So um, it's his kind of legacy is huge, but at, and at his time, um, this is where we see opposition to it as well, because not everyone obviously agreed with him. So um, it was uh, if just small acts of defiance, like, you know, not showing a salute um, pre-match as they were meant to, or um, refusing to change the Italianize their name from um, a German sounding one, if you're from the sort of Northeast of Italy. And then also, outside of Italy, because obviously it's very different to show um, opposition within Mussolini's Italy, outside of it, the, the 
the people who'd gone abroad because they'd been in exile um, quite often would cause trouble at, say, France 1938, the World Cup. There was a lot of protest there. And so there's lots of incidents of, of that, really, and uh, going on protest du during the war and then, sorry, before the war, and then during World War II, when Italy were involved with the um, German, Nazi Germany at that point in, in, as, a, as allies. Um, we, a lot of footballers became partisans. So they went, took to the hills, you know, with the machine guns and started, oh, you yeah. know, doing sabotage and things like that. So there's a lot of stadiums in Spain. Spain, sorry, start again. There's lots of stadiums in Italy that are named after um, Italian partisans and other victims um, of, of fascism during this period as well. So there's, there's um, that's quite interesting. I thought that was really interesting. And that sort of in turn has led on to the current kind of, I don't think there is more a political country football wise than italy domestically italy, totally yeah and Ar yeah. maybe argentina but italy is you can uh, see the politics in their football really clearly absolutely and although we do have to take a nuanced approach we can't all just say oh fans of this club are all right wing or fans of all fans of this club are left wing there's obviously and most people go to football just to watch football let's not forget that it's a local club they just want to see the unscripted drama of of a match right uh and hopefully their, their team will be successful but ultimately um sometimes there you know there are some elements that are that do have a political persuasion and so we get delve in in the book we delve into sort of why why that is and what various affiliations there are um other examples my favorite one is actually from portugal uh, and Portugal, which a lot of people may not know, because it's kind of like people don't necessarily wouldn't expect people to know Portuguese history, but they had the longest running dictatorship in Western Europe. It went from 1926 to 1974, and its name was the um, Estado Novo, the new state. And um, the dictator Salazar at the time, who's kind of kind of waning in the late night late 1960s, and uh, so he he's kind of handing over power to someone else. But the during this period, you as you know, in the 1968 was really marked across the world by student protests, um, things like this. And so everyone was gaining a bit more confidence. And in Portugal at the time in the late 60s, they're having lots of colonial wars with um, they had some African colonies, sort of legacy European thing um, with Angola, Mozambique, for example. So if you failed as a student in Portugal, you were sent to fight against you know these rebels in these in the Ooh. african colonies. i think even and, goa, um, goa in india uh, i'm from india so oh yeah. goa, goa was liberated in 1961 from the yeah there you are it's a direct connection there so it's it's exactly the same so they were the same experience as having goa was going on in india and uh, sorry in africa so um the students decided they did, they'd had enough of this and uh, their most famous university the oldest university coimbra they had a team called Academica de Coimbra, which people Coimbra. probably know now. It's quite quite a successful team. Well, it's well, not successful. It's quite a significant team in, in Portugal. And um, they, this protest were going on in the student uh, halls and things about this, um, this particular kind of aspect of their life. And then remarkably, Academica de Coimbra had an incredible cup run that went all the way to the final at the Estadio de Jumor, which is uh, the National Stadium of Portugal, which is people might know from Celtic winning the 1967 European Cup final there. It's very open, sort of concrete bowl in the woods, very scenic. Um, but anyway, so tens of thousands of students are descending on the, on the, um, uh, you know, on the stadium. Terraces. Sorry? I thought, you said, cup I thought you were going to say terraces. Yeah, yes, for the cup final, 1969, the Portuguese cup final. And Academia de Coimbra are playing Benfica and loads of students descending. And obviously the police can't kind of open fire on thousands of protesters like this in one go. So they turn off the TV transmission. Um, they do the radio one, but you still hear the protests in the background. Uh, and the team come on dressed in sort of black gowns and sort of really slow as if they're sort of pool bearers carrying a coffin. And they're just basically kind of kind of lamenting the, the death of, you know, or the, the state of Portugal and, and lack of democracy. And um, it's very, it kind of, this is the moment, the director of a film, I interviewed a director of a film uh, that was made about this uh, called Futebol de Causas, Football with a Cause. And he tells me, he thinks that this moment, um, this Portuguese cup final was like a moment that a lot, that gave a lot of confidence to kind of the resistance of, in, in Portugal and the, um, amongst the public. And uh, the, the whole, 
new state, as it was known, the Estado Novo, collapsed five years later in 1974 with the Carnation Revolution. And Portugal transitioned to democracy. And a lot of the people that had been involved in the Academica team were involved. They became politicians and, and lawyers and things like that. So it was a really significant moment. And it's not that long ago either. Like I said, it's the 1960s, 70s. So, yeah, um, yeah it's football is just entwined in politics. Yeah, that was exactly my next question, that how football is interwoven into and intertwined into politics. Uh, could you say that these defined stories of people fighting against the uh, dictators was the reason uh, football originated as a, you know, cause to fight back, not a cause, but a lane to fight back against the system? Maybe. Um, yeah, because it's really high profile. I mean, position. I, yeah, I mean, the introduction chapter, I... I interviewed an academic said why is football so important if you think about any sport that's politicized like moscow olympics berlin olympics they're already highly politicized um and so even well you know um as you know cricket can be as well so it's like um it's because it means so much to people and it's high news agenda and therefore high profile that it does really um have that sort of weight i suppose and i think that's where um uh, football as the glo the one single global, truly global sport really uh, is the one that sort of catches every attention and a lot of people can relate to. So um, that's kind of one of the reasons. That's I think also you see other examples like Argentina 78, where the World Cup was meant to be this kind of great propaganda victory for the, the junta, the um, military government of Argentina. But of course, all it did really was shine the, the, the attention of the world on their regime and what they were up to. So it kind of backfired in that respect and they collapsed a few years later as well, although that's more to do with the invasion of Falklands and things like that. So it was, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it is, a, like you said, they're kind of symbiotic in many ways, football and uh, politics. Oh, can you tell me more about the Falklands thing? I didn't know that how the World Cup drew attention to Argentina. Oh, yeah. So the 1978 World Cup. Um, well, Argentina were awarded the World Cup in the 60s so it's before their descent into civil war effectively and 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 a uh, right-wing military dictatorship. So um, there was a lot of discussion of whether they should, people should move the World Cup, um, but no, it went ahead in 1978. Um, and there were lots, there were thousands of disappeared as they've known. Uh, some of the footballers were trying to sort of, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of unease, especially much of the Dutch, the Dutch camp. Of course, they were, you know, when going in as one of the favorites, they reached the final, nearly won it, hit the post in the last minute. They'd been the finalists in 74. Um, there was a lot of discussion within Holland as to whether they should go. Um, and so basically there was a total discourse and Scotland as well, who went and they were also one of the favourites at the time and then had a terrible tournament. But um, there was, you know, a lot of discussion at home. There's massive resistance in, in France as well as to whether the team should go because um, and then that sort of shone a light on the fact that France was supplying um weapons to, to Argentina at that time. So it's like, um, so this was 1978. Um, so it basically shines, shines a light on on the um, the dictatorship and what was going on there. So internationally, people now know a bit more about what's going on in Argentina. Um, you know, it's a far flung country for many people that don't, wouldn't necessarily think about it. They actually loads of human rights abuses going on. Um, and then, yeah, you said they win it, they get this propaganda coup, and then um, in four years later, they invade La Las Alvinas or the Falkland Islands, um, and then the they kind of they lose that war and um the, ultimately that that humiliation leads to sort of the downfall of the the junta within a year i think after 1983 i think they collapsed oh um also uh, can you tell me more about these three major leaders and their connection to football one is general franco one is what mm. was what the qatar government with the world cup and all the ownership of city and one is erdogan I mean, you seem like the right person to tell me I uh, don't. I can't to tell you much about Erdogan and Qatar. Um, uh, the but I can tell you about Franco because I, you know, the interesting thing about Franco, unlike other contemporary um dictators of his time, like Mussolini, like Salazar in Portugal, like Adolf Hitler in Germany, uh, they didn't like football, whereas uh, Francisco Franco did. So he comes to power in nineteen. 39 in Spain after a three-year civil war that he started um, against the democratically elected um, Second Spanish Republic. Now, the he, he realises um, the propaganda value of football um, in the 50s when football starts becoming a bit more global or certainly Europeanized 
um, within Europe anyway. And obviously this this kind of help coincides with the rise of Real Madrid, which is the um, which is being spearheaded by uh, another a Franco supporter named uh, Santiago Bernabeu, who obviously yeah. the stadium's named after now. He kind of rebuilt Bernabeu rebuilds the club after the war because during the war the, the Stadio Chamartín, as they were uh, were in at the time, it's been dismantled for the defence of Madrid. It was under siege for three years, um, and if anything, Madrid was a uh, kind of I guess the leftist club at that point. So um, um, Bernabeu takes over Real Madrid revamped um, in the fifties. They become as you, they sign great players like Alfredo Di Stefano, uh, Fernandes Puskas, um, and they become five uh, European champions. champions five times. Yeah, exactly. And then well, six times a, a couple of years later. So it's um, they are very successful. And Franco doesn't miss the opportunity of this. He he he. He's, um, you know, treads a very, um, I guess he's kind of quite a fine line. He knows that need, they need competition in Spain, but at the same time abroad, definitely Real Madrid is a really, is like a bit of an ambassador for them. But there's also the national team. Um, he refuses to play the Soviet Union, which is communist, of course, uh, in 1960, uh, the European Championship. So Spain kind of forfeit their position in that tournament. And yet four years later, Spain wins the European Championship against the Soviet Union. Um, so again, this is propaganda gold for for Franco. He can prove this is a victory over communism. It's the culmination of his, um, you know, beliefs that, that he is right and all that sort of thing. So he's using football, which is basically you know twenty two men kicking a a pig's bladder around a um, a field. <laughs> he uses that to justify you know all the things he's he did. Yeah. yeah. So it's um it's all about it, it. You can so closely link um you know football with with politics. Crazy. Also, uh, somewhere I heard that Franco uh, supported Atletico de Aviación. What do you think about that? Um, I don't know if he supported. I mean, he sort of came out and supported anyone in particular. Um, you may you mentioned Atletico Aviación. That is the team of the Air Force, mixed with Atletico, what is now Atletico Madrid. So Atletico, where well, they call they were called Athletic uh, de Madrid before that because they were part of the um, the Madrid branch of the Athletic Club de Bilbao, which I'm sure everyone knows. Um, they were a branch of Athletic Club uh, de Bilbao. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were well. They were spin offs of it, and um, that's why they got the red and white stripes. Yeah, and then they. Did you know, yeah, so they then got the blue shorts from the the aviation, the aviation team. They are, uh, you know, the um, the air force. Uh, they win the first league after the back after the after the civil war. Actually, in nineteen forty, they win La Liga um, as this kind of joint team. But bear in mind that Spain's a bit of a mess at this point. So um, yeah, so they are quite strong at this this point. They um, and then they become Franco does insist, like Mussolini did, that all names are. Uh, in their case, Hispanified. So any English traces are taken away. So um, Atletico, Athletic de Madrid become Atletico de Madrid, um, Athletic Club de Bilbao, which is founded by English people and there is obviously very Basque. Uh, they are called Atletico de Bilbao. Um, and then there's Football Club Barcelona, which of course was Anglo-Swiss founded. That mm -hmm. becomes Club de uh, Barcelona, Club de Football, I think it was. So it's, um, you know, all these kind of... Wait, wait, any... Barcelona, even Barcelona. I thought Barcelona was Football Club Barcelona, right? Yeah, it is now, but it wasn't during the Franco years. Um, every club in Spain had a member of Franco's party instilled in their board just to keep an eye on things. So so it's... um, This is where a lot of the Mexican club thing comes around with, with Barcelona more than a club. That comes around because... Um, uh, largely because they're of this continuous clash yeah, with the center i suppose yeah so they you know especially during the franco years it gets exacerbated where the um uh in catalonia you cannot i mean the 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 catalan language was oppressed to say um was suppressed um but the only place you could speak it publicly and show your flags and things without being arrested on mass was a place like the football ground um you know at um, camp no so um this is kind of uh where Barca becomes this kind of, or perceived as locally anyway, this kind of um uh I guess torch for for the Catalan people at the time. It's different now, I suppose, it's a very international brand, Barcelona, and mm. that the same issues that um were I mean, they've obviously Catalonia's got a strong independence movement now, but it's not quite the same situation as it was under Franco, where because they've got an autonomous government, for example, which they didn't have under Franco. So yeah, things a lot of things have changed. Spain's again, like Italy 
very regionalized. It's fascinating the way that local football clubs or even the national ones, so Madrid, Barca, is obviously they win most most titles. So yes, you might have your local club, but then you're like Malaga or like I don't know Leganes, Leganes. but you might then sort of pick one of your favorite of Madrid, Barca, who you want to would rather win see win the league, you know, rather than uh, because uh, you know your local club's not going to do it. Uh, so about Catalan independence, did Franco use Madrid as like a pawn to prove that unified Spain was good? I heard that somewhere. Um. Well, I mean, I think it. Uh, it's. I mean, it's interesting. I think he knew it, realized um, the importance of healthy competition to keep things. So it looks like there wasn't a new sort of bias. Um, but the the ultimately, I think the the value of Real Madrid to 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 the Franco regime is more external, to be honest, than internal. Um, it's um, again, this is we have to take a nuanced approach. Most fans would have just gone to support the club, so it's not necessarily um, you know, a political thing <laughs> for most people. They just go, they want to see some entertainment, they they leave again. But yeah, definitely, um definitely value to the regime to have that reflected glory of Real Madrid doing well in Europe. The last two questions I have are about are basically polar opposites. One is, okay. do, you, do you think sports washing is real and, you know, uh, uh, is it really that prevalent? And the other question is, do you think that, you know, analyzing so much about football, especially what you do, lose it, makes you lose the foreign football or does it make it more interesting? Um, well, first question, um, on sports washing, I think, I think everyone knows how it works. I think um, uh, that if anything, similar to what I was saying about Argentina 78, the more that someone brings a focus to themselves, uh, the more people are going to scrutinize it. Um, mm -hmm. So, but I mean, I, uh, this kind of links to your second point. I've given up on the Premier League here um, because it's all about money. Uh, it's very becoming very predictable. The same three, four teams will win it. Um, I know that's better than say Germany where one team wins it uh, yeah. or Spain where two team wins it, but still it's just, it's just get a bit boring. And that's why that leads to the the second point, which is the ground hopping, which is why I like going to lower league English football or um, overseas football overseas. So last week I was at, um, I was in Italy. So I went to a Napoli match, um, which was great. So it's different, um, but again, still top, you know, top tier elite football. But then the very next day I went to Serie C, the third division, and I got a to completely different experience, which is like really authentic, lots of fans, really passionate about their local club, which was Juve Stavia. Uh, it's under the kind of, um, it's in the shadow of Vesuvius, you know, the volcano. Um, and so you've got like this amazing setting. You've got these classic Italian stone pines, which are those flat trees, just shading everything. It's just, you know, lots of kind of graffiti and ultras with flags and 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 different songs different language and i just i just a different style of play and that's what i like i mean personally i will go i'd rather and I, yes i'll watch premier league highlights just out of interest to see what's happening but i don't really go to the premier league it's too expensive it's difficult to get tickets it's not even that great in it i personally don't think it's that great a, a live experience um when i've been to these other places which are especially across europe especially where um um you know, I guess the further down the leagues you go, you get this really like more authentic Sorry experience. Sorry, the earth experience, yeah. Yeah, so it's just about being, just about, so it being football people, it's, you know, ultimately it's the people's game and it's the people that make it. Um, and yes, the product on the pitch at the elite level in Europe is phenomenal. Um, and we should all respect that. But at the same time, if you're going for an experience and you, uh, then I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know. I just, I mean, yeah, if you're from outside, UK and you come to England and yeah obviously you want to catch a Premier League match just to say you've been there to go to some amazing historic grounds like Old Trafford or Anfield um, uh, Fulham is the one I recommend everyone goes to first by the way Craven Cottage that's a well, really it's historic it's the place. noisiest one right I've heard Fulham? Oh I'm not sure about that <laughs> or Sel oh, Fulham or Sellers Park maybe one of those I think oh, Sellers Park is good yeah Sellers Park's got an, uh, it's got a little ultra, European inspired ultras um, in the in the Holmesdale end yeah yeah they're they're good. They they add a lot of atmosphere, and we need that really. Uh, so finally, yeah, that was it. And I'd like to ask one last question: Is uh, for which club have you seen which has been really less hyped, but uh, 
it still has a really great culture and setting around because i have seen many like freiburg uh, betis all of them have mm. now come into the limelight from the shadows of how yep. great they are but which ones have you visited which you found the most unique and that's funny you mentioned you mentioned that actually because i'm feeling the same way about union berlin now because i i went to union berlin when they were in the zwei bundesliga and yeah second league and uh it was a lot of fun there's a lot of atmosphere and now they're in the you know in the top flight doing really well in the bundesliga and it's like oh no don't ever change please so <laughs> um yes i mean i like brescia for example in yeah. uh, italy brescia, brescia and um their close rival atalanta they, those two, they're very close to each other, about an hour away on the train. So if you ever go um, to Lombardy, um, that's the region of Italy. It's absolutely fantastic. The um, the atmosphere, especially if you go to a, a night game at either of those places, phenomenal atmosphere. And they're kind of quite, you know, small but intense kind of grounds. Um, so, yeah, Italy, you'd get a really good good culture there. Rio Vercano, very famously, St. Pauli, very famously. And if you're in England um, and you want to go lower leagues, Really Paul friendly Smith. atmosphere. Uh, well, yeah, Portsmouth is okay. <laughs> I was going to say Dulwich Hamlet, um, which is a non-league team uh, in South London, Zone Three. So it's like very near the centre. Um, it's about three stops from London Bridge, I think. And um, they get about two thousand fans, which for a non-league club is a phenomenal amount. Yeah. And um, it's a really friendly, very um, open crowd, um, and uh, they're quite, quite sort of. Um, uh, vocal, should we say? So yeah, that's that's um that's that's what I recommend. I mean, every club has a different experience, um, you know. So uh, and and culture, and that's what makes it special, really. So yeah, I guess that was it for today. First of all, uh, thank you for joining me for this interview. Uh, and you really motivated me to you know travel not just Europe but even in my country, India. I hope you mm -hmm. come to India once. I'll show you Goa, Kerala. You know, we can do something and yeah. watch a match in Mumbai maybe and I'll show you the culture around here but uh, anyway uh, thanks for guiding me around Europe and it was very exciting to talk about politics and football no. thank you